pagkakaisa, pagsulong, narito tayo Para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong, narito tayo Para ang kalak-kalak na puloy, magiging muok na huwag Pagkakaisa, paglaban, tagumpay Hello, good afternoon uh, mga kasama at good afternoon international comrades. Welcome back again to the National Democratic Line Online School. And in this episode, we are going to tackle a very special, important, and a uh, and a timely topic in uh, ahead of the Conference of Parties 26 happening in Glasgow next month, which will be a climate action uh, for the climate crisis, I know. So, uh, with that being said, we've decided at the ND Line Online to give a special episode about the climate crisis that is happening in the Philippines. And first one in the topics is the climate imperialism. In this episode, we are going to tackle the effects of imperialism in the Philippine climate. As much as everyone is concerned, we are on a deadline and we are in a rush. So, again. The imperialism, uh, abolishing imperialism is a must. So, yeah, without being said, let's go further ahead to the topic. Um, we are wel welcoming uh, our resident speaker here at ND Line Online, uh, ILPS Chief Emeritus, Tito Joma Season. Tito, kamusta po? Mapagpalayang uh, hapon sa inyo. Uh, mapagpalayang, uh, um, pagbati sa, sa iyo, ka Angelo, at sa lahat ng ating tagapaginig. Ayan. Sige, uh, Tito, uh, again, we've discussed no, na, na the COP26 or the Conference of Parties has begun in Italy uh, last month, uh, this month actually, October, and we will, uh, there's a culminating event happening in Edinburgh in Scotland by the end of October. Sorry, Glasgow in Scotland by the end of October to November. No, we are thus excited to have this special on climate crisis. To begin, Tito, did Marx and Engels envision that rapid industrialization will ultimately lead to a crisis on climate? Ano? And what do they have to say about relationship of man and culture? Can you suggest us some reading materials? At the time of Marx and Engels in the 19th century, the degree of industrialization that uh, free competition capitalism achieved did not yet cause damage to the environment or to the ozone layer in particular to an extent causing drastic climate change and threatening the very existence of humanity. But they saw the need for humanity to understand the laws of nature, make wise utilization of nature, and have harmonious relations with it. It would take a further development of capitalism to its monopoly stage uh, that science and technology would be used by the monopoly capitalist class to plunder, pollute, and ruin the environment to the extent of posing the danger of human e extinction. We are now confronted by the problem of huge amounts of carbon dioxide emissions 
that are causing global warming. We are nearing the tipping point of irreversible environmental destruction. Scientists, conscientious social activists, and the broad masses of the people are alarmed and concerned with the heating up of the surface of the oceans, the frequent wide-scale forest fires, the melting of icebergs, and rise of the sea level. Since the very foundation of the theory of Marxism, Dialectical materialism has taken into account that humanity is part of nature and that humanity and nature as distinguishable phenomena have an interactive relationship. In Dialectics of Nature, Frederick Engels sought to relate the natural sciences to the social sciences. He paid attention to anthropology in both the aforesaid book and origin um, of the family, private property, and the state. He showed that man made himself through labor and that the dialectical relationship between humans and nature involves both unity, man being part of nature, and struggle. He defined in the part played by labor in the transition from ape to man, the basic position of Marxism. Labor is a source of all wealth, uh, the political economists assert, and it really is the source next to nature, which supplies it with the material that it converts into wealth. In his critique of the Gotha, of the Gotha program, Marx declared, labor is not the source of all wealth. Nature is just as much the source of use values, and it is surely of such that material wealth consists as labor, which itself is only the manifestation of a force of nature, human labor power. Only in so far as man from the beginning behaves towards nature, the primary source of all instruments and subjects of labor as an owner treats her as belonging to him. Thus his uh, uh, labor become the source of use values, therefore also of wealth. Uh, uh, Marx uh, put it uh, in a very uh, concise way. Uh, nature is the mother um, of, uh, of production and labor uh, power is the father uh, of production. Mm -hmm. That's pretty insightful, Tito. But uh, I think there's more context of uh, of that uh, that's going to be tackled on the next following questions. So we have here, Tito. How does monopoly cap capitalism contribute to the plunder of our environment? You know, what is the what is what are you know, the direct foreign investment? Uh, could you give some examples? Pagdating sa Philippines, and why do you think climate imperialism have an impact? on semi-colonial and semi-feudal countries like Philippines. Foreign monopoly capitalism has been the main factor in the plunder and destruction of our environment. It deploys direct investments to acquire assets in the Philippines and exploit its natural and human resources. It also deploys loans in order to perpetuate underdevelopment and high profitability for the foreign investors. It has imposed uh, on us the use of fossil fuel in our households, transport system, and workplaces. This has emitted a huge amount of carbon dioxide polluting our lungs and contributing to the destruction of the ozone layer, the intensification of radiation, and global warming. Foreign Philippines to providing cheap raw materials and cheap labor in exchange for imported manufacturers. It has extracted super profits by cutting down our forest to take logs, using open pit mining to take out a wide range of mineral ores and expanding monocrop plantations for the purpose of export. Chemicals used in mining and monocrop plantations have poisoned the streams and the fields for producing food staples for the people. U.S. imperialism has also manipulated weather conditions to wage geological, geological war against its enemies in the Asian mainland, 
And the Philippines is also adversely affected because it is in the path of super typhoons directed against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. There are extreme changes of climate from super typhoons through floods to droughts. The warming of the seas has speeded up the super typhoons and the loss of forest cover has made them more destructive than ever. Soil erosions and landslides have increased. I see, Tito. Um, further, uh, sa questions natin, no? uh, Philippines is a country usually uh, battered by natural calamities. No? What do the progressive forces and revolutionary forces do to fight against the worsening global climate crisis? And how can these forces help whenever the country is hit by a catastrophe? How do these catastrophes then affect the principles and ideologies of a revolutionary and an activist? I think there's a pretty good question for all of us. Indeed, the Philippines is hit by 20 to 25 super typhoons every year. The progressive and revolutionary forces must arouse, organize, and mobilize the people against the dumping of fossil fuel, oil, gas, and coal on the Philippines by the foreign oil companies and demand the accelerated adoption of environment-friendly technologies to generate energy, such as the use of uh, solar, wind, hydrogen, and tidal power. When catastrophes hit the country, the progressive and revolutionary forces must undertake campaigns to provide uh, relief and rehabilitation to the people in need and demand the end of policies and practices that result in the catastrophes and the failure of the reactionary government to serve the interests of the people. It is perfectly in accordance with the principles and ideologies of the legal national democratic movement and the People's Democratic Revolution to struggle for ending the policies and practices of foreign monopoly capitalism and the reactionary government that plunder and destroy the environment and cause the catastrophes. The protection, conservation, and wise utilization of the natural resources are in consonance with the anti-imperialist and democratic struggle, as well as with the revolutionary struggle of the oppressed and exploited classes. I see. I think it is manifested, Tito, no? uh, out of all the catastrophes and natural calamities that have happened in the country, it is always the revolutionaries and the activists that is on the first responders in uh, climate. And we see it from time and time again that um, the, the disaster response from the government is always backward and uh, always had a hit of corruption, uh, you know, contrib not contributing to the further uh, marginalization and uh, uh, oppression to the people. How about, Tito, going to the next question, po, no? Can techno technical techno technological advancement and protection of nature coexist, no? Yung technology and nature, or does our modern society mother uh, society mother to the death of nature, such as what we habitually see in sci-fi movies and books. Science and technology can be used by the people to serve their needs and at the same time advance and protect nature in contradiction with the monopoly bourgeoisie that uses science and technology to plunder and destroy nature for the sole purpose of taking super profits and that avoids the cost of conserving, restoring, and renewing renewable resources in the environment. The, monop the monopoly bourgeoisie uses not only the sci-fi movies and books, but also other means of information and education to spread uh, the false notion that the people are helpless and uh, lie that uh, economic development is impossible, unsustainable, or self-destructive if undertaken by the people and their progressive and revolutionary forces in the global south, and not by the imperialist firms and banks which are supposed to be readily endowed with the technology and financial resources to fix the problem of environment degradation and damage that they themselves have wrought. 
I see, Tito. That is so correct and that is so sharp. Uh, Tito, this month, no, uh, we are celebrating uh, the Peasant Month. And I think peasant have been drastically and, and always in the front line of uh, being hit or feeling this uh, the change uh, over the climate. No, so it's it's enough to ask you, Tito. How does climate change affect the livelihoods of peasants and indigenous people uh, in the world, particularly sa atin in the Philippines? Can you explain po more about mining? quarries and dams because they promise progress and development in these areas but what and how do they impact on uh, the peasant communities climate change adversely affects the livelihoods of peasants and indigenous peoples in the world particularly in the philippines because the unpredictable shifts from one extreme climatic condition to another to another destroys the crops or prevents any timely measure to save them, if any. A super typhoon, a flood, or a drought is capable of destroying the crop and prevents the peasant communities from reaping the fruits of their labor. Mining and quarries destroy the foliage that protects and gives nutrients to the farms and crops of the peasant communities. They can cause the streams to dry up or take a course away from the, from, from the farms. They cause soil erosion and landslides. Mining operations use acids uh, that uh, poison the streams. The use of explosives in mining has made earthquakes uh, very frequent. Dams are built to concentrate the flows of streams and rivers in one direction. Thus, many of the widespread peasant communities are deprived of water for their farms and daily needs. They are often deprived of any satisfactory program of resettlement because of bureaucrat corrupt, bureaucratic corruption. Yeah, I can imagine, Tito, no, I think uh, it's safe to say that the, the primary, uh, yun nga, uh, the, the first hand who are always experiencing the climate crisis are the indigenous people and the peasants as uh, the exploitation of the land and the their home. Uh, basically, their home are the ones being uh, exploited. Uh, the, the trees are being cut down from their homes where they live. Uh, you know, it is being mined, it is being destroyed. So aside from the first-hand effect, they also experience displacement and uh, further oppression. Po. Hindi po ba? So, Tito, the Philippines is obviously an, a tropical country. It's, a, it's an island nation. Our seas are a great abundance po of, uh, are great abundance. There's a lot of resources coming from it. But why are our fisher works, uh, fisher, fisher folks in a dire situation po now? And why is there a need for us to import fish as well as import, you know, the very resources that we deal from the lands are going, are, we are importing it from other countries like uh, the other agricultural products such as rice and uh, such. Po. One third of the fish requirement of the Philippines is supposed to come from the West Philippine Sea, but our sovereign and maritime rights have been sold out by the Duterte regime to China. Despite the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the legal victory of the Philippines before the permanent arbitration core in The Hague in 2016. Chinese factory ships and fleets of boats have been sucking up the fish uh, from the West Philippine Sea and preventing Filipino fishermen to fish there. So the solution of the traitor Duterte is to buy galunggong and canned sardines from the Chinese in the name of neoliberalism. We buy the fish stolen from us. Also, Duterte has a stupid policy in agriculture. He lowers the buying price of rice under the National Food Authority to kill our peasant producers and imports rice from abroad. He and his big comprador cronies make a killing both ways. But he is destroying the livelihood of the peasants and wasting the foreign exchange resources of the Philippines. It is absurd that the Philippines, an agricultural country, has become one of the world's top 
rice importers. Mm -hmm. Ito. Um, following with uh, our question, um, how is the practice and tradition po of indigenous people different from ours and what can we learn from them? The indigenous people abound in the hills and mountains of the hinterlands. They are basically peasant in class terms. They have been able to subsist by combining agriculture with fruit gathering, hunting, and fishing in local streams. We can learn from them how to work and survive with a low level of technology and assist them in obtaining economic and technical assistance and social services. We can also help or join them in defending the environment and struggling against the invasion by logging, mining, uh, and plantation companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right, Tito. So, yeah, I think we are getting a clear picture now that it's always the indigenous people and the peasant uh, uh, are experiencing, and it's highly important to express this, especially in the country whose population are consist of mostly farmers and peasants and indigenous people. Po. Following Tito, um, I think, I think being said, no, uh, the, the, there's an existence of the new people's army in the countryside where peasants and indigenous people are located. They also call themselves as green army because they are protecting the nature. In what manner po, can they respect and protect the forests and jungles of the country while making it their home? The Red Commanders and Fighters of the New People's Army um, uh, indeed can be called uh, Green Guerrillas because they respect and protect the forest and jungles of the country because mm -hmm. these are their homes and bulwarks for guerrilla warfare, political military training, cooperation with the indigenous people, and source of food. They unite and cooperate with the indigenous communities and poor peasants in preventing the logging, mining, plantations, and tourist or real estate companies from grabbing their land and other natural resources. I see. I think that just makes sense, Tito, that, um, uh, you know, there's this issue of land being stolen and indigenous people and uh, peasant communities in the countryside just needed to protect themselves. And how could they protect themselves if they have uh, you know, if these big companies have armed goons to to attack and they just need to, I, I think they just need to fight back. And yeah, uh, it just it just makes sense that uh, the New People's Army as protect as protector of the indigenous and peasant communities in the countryside are also protector of their homes that uh, where these communities live and um, uh, and the areas that they reside to. Yeah. Next question, Tito. Because uh, being said, the New People's Armies are revolutionaries. And you, Tito, also are one, are a revolutionary. How is being a Marxist and a Leninist impacts one stand mm. on climate crisis? And why is it essential for revolutionaries to take part in the struggle against climate injustices? As a Marxist-Leninist and proletarian revolutionary, it is my duty to fight foreign monopoly capitalism and the local exploiting classes of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists who collaborate in exploiting and oppressing the toiling masses of workers and peasants. The indigenous people and poor peasant settlers are most subjected to land grabbing and displacement by logging, mining, plantation, and real estate companies that ruin the environment and aggravate the climate, the climate crisis. The fight for climate injustice is necessarily a national and class struggle against the foreign monopoly capitalists and the local exploiting classes that bring about climate injustice. That's right, Tito Po. Um, again, going to the last question, Tito, why, what can we learn from Marxism, Leninism in advancing the fight against climate crisis? We learn from Marxism, Leninism, the fundamental principles about humanity, 
being a part of nature. There are dialectical relations in the course of the prehistoric and historic development of human society. The worst attacks done by monopoly capitalism on both humanity and nature, and the possibility that humanity under socialism and communism can use the natural and social sciences to avail of nature without damaging and destroying it, but making it even more green, abundant, and fruitful. Mm -hmm. That's right, Tito. Um, thank you so much, Tito, for answering all the discussion questions that we have sent to you. Um, we are now proceeding to the question, the 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 floor for question. We are opening the floor for question and answer. So uh, our audience, the man, can ask questions directly to you about the topic, the climate imperialism. However, Tito, while we are waiting for them to send their questions to us, you can drop it on the comment section or send us a private message. Uh, we are going to go in a quick break. So we will resume and the line will resume and we will be right back. Mga kamay ay puno ng butil ng bigas Silang bumubuhay sa mga taong nangangahas Nasabihin wala silang pakisadahas Na dinadanas ng mga pumipitas ng kung anong Sa kinakain mo ay may dugong dumanak Wala ka pa rin bang balak na baguhin ang pagtingin Sa sistemang mapagpanggap na akala mo ikaw ay lumalanghap Nang kalayaan Nang kalayaan Nang kalayaan Nang kalayaan Lupang pinangako Lupang minana Lupang pinangako Malis ka sa lupang ninuno Kapalit ng kwarta ay dugo Ang pinandidilig para sa mga luho Kinabukas ay isa na patpad Kundi sa kalayang huwag Mga ambog, mga perdugo Ninanakaw pati ang buhay mo Pisante, mabuhay ka Lupa mo ay nakit na Mga ambog, mga mandarambog Tunay pumuputok ka ba ako'y tumutuklop Pesante ang mabuhay ka Lupa mo ay nangkit na Mga umbok, mga mandarumbok Tunay pumuputok ka ba ako'y tumutuklop Pesante ang mabuhay ka Lupa mo ay nangkit na Mga umbok, mga mandarumbok Tunay pumuputok ka ba ako'y tumutuklop Oh, oh, oh Mga ambog, mga, mga mandarambog Pisante ang mabuhay ka Mga kamay ay puno ng butil ng bigas Silang bumubuhay sa mga taong nangangahas Nasabihing wala silang pakisadas Na dinadanas ng mga naghihirap Yan ang buhay ng pesante Banks and investors say that coal power is needed for poorer or rather overexploited countries to develop economically. But in reality, 
Coal is only pouring more fuel into the climate crisis. The truth is that coal is actually harming the very countries it's supposed to be helping. And banks keep making excuses so they can keep bankrolling the coal industry. Here are five reasons why no one needs coal. One, burning coal goes against global agreements to bring down carbon emissions. It doesn't matter where coal gets burned, it has the same effect. It makes our planet hotter. Two, Poor or overexploited countries are being hit hardest by the climate crisis, and these are the very countries that coal is supposed to be helping. 3. Coal gets far too much credit for reducing poverty. For instance, extreme poverty in China was pretty much gone before coal power stations spread across the country. 4. The pollution from burning coal causes heart disease, lung disease, and cancer. My country, the Philippines, is dependent on coal, but air pollution causes an estimated 27,000 premature deaths per year. 5. Renewable energy is now cheaper than coal, so why spend loads of money on expensive power stations? No one needs coal. We'll all be better off without it. Magbubukit panahon na ng pagkakaisa Magtamon labanan ng pagsasamantala Harapin ang bukas ng buong pag-asa Lakas ng masa siyang mapagpasya Bisig ng nagsakay siyang walang palay Wala rin kapital baon pa sa utang Lupang hinahangag, hindi pa makamtan Magkos pa mamas lang, lakas ang siyang gawag Magbubukit panahon na ng pagkakaisa Magsamong labanan ng pagsasamantala Harapin ang bukas ng buong pag-asa Lakas ng masa ang siyang mapagpasya Kilusang magbubukit ating ibandila Kasama ang tanang anak ng paggawa Dukhay gigit hawa sa mithing nakila At ang sambayan ay magtatamong laya Magbubukit panahon na ng pagkakaisa Magbamon labanan ng pagsasamantala Harapin ang bukas ng buong pag-asa Lakas ng masa ang siyang mapagpasya Tayo'y binikis sa iisang hangad Nang gutom at hirap sa bukid at bayan Masang inaapis siyang mag-aaklas Ang bayang gising ang magbabalikwas Magbubukit panahon na ng pagkakaisa Magbawang labanan ng pagsasamantala Harapin ang bukas ng buhay pag-asa Lakas ng masa ang siyang mapagpasya Nag-iisa tayong magbubukit Masang manggagawa ang kakapit-bisig Kasama ang iba pang alipin at lupig Sa kilasang magbubukit ng Pilipinas Tagumpay ang awi Mga kamay ay puno ng butil ng bigas Silang bumubuhay sa mga taong nangangahas Nasabihin wala silang pakisadahas Na tinadanas ng mga pumipitas Nang kung anong sa kinakain mo ay may dugong dumanak wala ka pa rin bang balak na baguhin ang pagtingin Sa sistemang mapagpanggap na akala mo ikaw ay lumayan
Ayan, welcome back again to the National Democratic Line Online School. We are again tackling the climate imperialism. So we are we have opened the floor a while ago for the question and answer portion in which some of the audiences have now sent their questions. Again, it's still open. You can drop it in the comment sections or send us a private message if uh, if you if you want to feel that um, uh, that sense of confidentiality. So again, uh, Tito. To start again with uh, our first question from the audience, uh, sent from a private chat. No, how does the huge foreign-owned fishing boats affect the livelihood of our fisher folks? And what about the situation in the South China Sea? The livelihood of our fisher folk is adversely affected by the Chinese, Japanese, and other foreign factory ships and fishing boats operating in the Philippine seas. In the South China Sea, the Chinese have taken over Panatag Shoal and the rest of the West Philippine Sea. Thus, we are now we now have to import from China fish stolen from our own seas. Mm -hmm. I see. I see, Tito. Um, with that being said, we could proceed now to the question, next question. Po. Um, sabi di tito, tito, how does the NPA help in relief operations during the crisis? And how do they survive the earthquakes and typhoons? Po? It is uh, a fundamental principle and long-standing policy of the NPA, the New People's Army, to help the people in relief operations during calamities and crises. Being a disciplined and mobile force, the NPA can move easily to, more, to uh, uh, relatively more secure areas during earthquakes and typhoons. But still, they have to endure and overcome the same difficulties as the people. Mm -hmm. Right, Tito. How about uh, next question, Tito? It's about the Kaingen system from the farmers. You know? Kaingen system has been a practice now for many years. Why is it bad for the nature? Uh, the Canadian system is often used as a whipping dog uh, by the publicists of the exploiting classes. It is relatively harmless in comparison to the large-scale grabbing and misuse of the land by the logging, mining, plantation, and real estate companies. Sweden farming has been a traditional method for the poor peasants and lower middle peasants to make a living. In the first place, Sweden farming is usually undertaken in logged over areas. What is slashed and burned is secondary forest growth uh, in logged over areas. The revolutionary forces can mitigate the damage to climate by planting Sweden farms with uh, fruit trees and other crops that retain and enhance the fertility of the soil. I see. Um, next question, Dito, ano, Tito, is does being a revolutionary automatically mean being an environmentalist? If you are a revolutionary, you must be an environmentalist. You must join or support the campaign to preserve and protect the environment. At best, you can join the people in the Philippines who are very much engaged in the midst of the uh, indigenous people, um, a fighting for their ancestral domain and the protection of the environment. Yes, I believe, Tito, there has been uh, many democratic mass organizations tackling, focusing on climate. There's uh, Youth Advocates for Climate Action in the Philippines, Fridays for Future for Philippines, and um, AGHAM, you know, uh, those particularly scientists, science-based mass organizations. So uh, next question, Tito, we could proceed from the audience is, how does the war of aggression aggravate the climate crisis? The war of aggression aggravates the climate crisis because it uses weapons of mass destruction, such as Agent Orange and uh, other defoliants, um, napalm, white phosphorus uh, mm -hmm. uh, bombs, uh, cluster bombs with uh, uh, radioactive uh, explosives and other bombs that destroy the forest chemicals uh, that poison the streams and disease-carrying animals and uh, uh, insects. Of course, the worst that can happen would be for the imperialists to use uh, uh, nuclear weapons and uh, um, and biological weapons of mass destru destruction in their uh, 
a war of aggression against each other. Indeed, Tito. I think um, it's 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 really blatant, or it's really seen there. It's out there that the you the imperialists haven't not um, have not learned from the previous uh, the previous mistakes happened from the, in the course of history, such as like the the bombing during the World Wars, who like totally destroyed almost the world, and like now they're still continue to do it in the wars in the global south in the middle east so yeah bringing down imperialism i believe is also a pre, uh, you know a prerogative in fighting for the climate crisis we could proceed tito on the next question po no what impact does free market have on climate imperialism and further destruction of our environment in the name of the free market the neoliberal policy predetermines the character of the Philippine economy as a supplier of uh, cheap raw materials and cheap labor and as buyer of foreign manufacturers. Thus, foreign monopoly capitalism has been able to plunder the natural resources of the Philippines, destroy the environment and biodiversity and uh, aggravate the climate crisis. Yes, I, I agree, Tito. Um, we can proceed now to the next question from our audience. Sabi niya po dito, I, uh, there's a movement in the Western countries like the UK to fully transition to renewable energy, such as fuel cars being phased out and replaced of electric cars. But the global south is still heavily reliant in fuel and coal energy. Paano niyo po, uh, how do you think imperialism manifests in this issue? On the surface, this is a good thing eh, that uh, um, Western countries are adopting uh, renewable energy. Uh, but then I think the uh, uh, foreign monopoly firms, the, the monopoly firms are so heavily invested in fossil fuels that they will not engage for, from them um, uh, and opt for the use of this uh, um uh, renewable energy um, um, uh, source um, uh, and then uh, you know uh, they take advantage they continue to take advantage of the uh, third world countries um, they um, they have summits in Paris but then they uh, try to commodify uh, the problem they try to uh, say well uh, uh, there is a value, um, there is money value in countries uh, abstaining uh, from the use of uh, um, fossil fuel, uh, so let it be. Uh, that uh, the allowances um, that are given to the poor countries could be bought by the imperialist countries. So they have, have all sorts of devices to take advantage of the plight eh, of the uh, global south. Uh, so um, uh, we don't believe that uh, they will, um, uh, the imperialist countries and the foreign monopoly, and then the monopoly firms will adapt um, um, renewable energy um, uh, fast enough. Uh, they will continue uh, to, um, uh, to profit from what they had previously invested at the expense of the of the oppressed peoples and nations in the third world. I agree. I agree, Tito. Following the questions we have, ano, sabi dito, Tito, is it true that imperialist countries manipulate the climate? And why do they do it? Yes, well, I think uh, man their manipulation of the climate problem uh, makes... Um, uh, makes the problem profitable to them, as I've already pointed out. So they recognize uh, the problem of excessive carbon dioxide emissions. But then they will say, well, the, um, and the underdeveloped countries uh, may be entitled to allowances uh, um, to use uh, 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 fossil fuels because these are still cheaper. And then, uh, and at the same time, they can also earn by selling their allowances uh, to the imperialist countries. So 
<laughs> the various countries are not sincere about uh, yes. reducing uh, carbon dioxide by resorting to uh, environment friendly energy sources. Indeed, Tito. Um, so, with that being said, Tito, we can proceed to the quest next question from audience. Sabi dito, what program does the CPP, NPA, and the F NDFP have in protecting the environment? No. Paano po? Well, there are many programs and uh, uh, which the CPP, NPA, and NDF uh, can uh, get into. And these programs are, um, uh, are developed by uh, uh, social activists, uh, uh, social formations, and um, by uh, 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 environment-friendly scientists and, uh, uh, and technologists. So uh, uh, the um, many um, organizations and movements are uh, um, taking matters into their hands because despite their demands uh, for environment-friendly programs of uh, energy generation, uh, the imperialist countries and the monopoly firms continue uh, to abuse uh, uh, the, the use of fossil fuel and um, they continue to act at the expense of uh, uh, the third world countries. Sorry. I agree with you, Tito. Um, going next to the next question, po, ano, sabi dito, the process of globalization has spread the assembly lines around the world. How does this contribute to the climate crisis? Well, uh, there is the cynical uh, claim of the advocates of neoliberal globalization that um, if the underdeveloped countries have their comparative advantage, in uh, selling their natural resources and then uh, uh, being the uh, object of dumping of uh, fossil fuel, so let it be. That is supposed to be uh, their comparative advantage, but I, I call it the perpetuated, uh, um, uh, perpetuated comparative disadvantage of the underdeveloped you know, uh, against the machinations, against the neoliberal policy of the imperialist countries and uh, their um, um, monopoly firms. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this, uh, this is an old uh, um, uh, principle of uh, free market. No? Well, mm -hmm. you make, you, you avail of what you can produce uh, um, most efficiently and where you can get uh, profits, but then in general, uh, there is a reduction of the, uh, the underdeveloped countries to being suppliers, mere suppliers of raw materials, and being the dumping ground of manufacturers. And um, uh, the uh, underdeveloped countries of the third world are, are always the last to benefit from any kind of tech, uh, technological advance uh, that you may consider environment friendly. I think uh, you are very well aware that the use of fossil fuel is still very much uh, uh, it's, uh, it's still very much uh, being uh, imposed on on the whole world by the by the oil monopoly firms. Um, so there is a lot of hypocrisy by uh, people in authority, by by you know imperialist states in claiming that they are facing up to the problem of uh, climate change. I agree. I agree with you, Tito. Um, next up, uh, sabi po dito, daanan nga daw po ng bagyo at kalamidad ang Pilipinas. Meron po ba ang climate fund sa ating bansa? Ano po ang handling ni Duterte sa disaster relief? Uh, it translates to um, the Philippines have, uh, the Philippines are always hit by um, storms and calamities. Does the Philippines have climate funds, and how does Duterte handle disaster relief? Uh, on its own scale, the Philippines uh, uh, contributes to the uh, uh, global warming. Uh, but there are, you know, bigger uh, factors in the global warming, like, you know, the attack on the forest uh, of uh, the Amazon. 
Huh? Um, that is supposed to be the Amazon, is supposed to be the lung of the world, and it has been uh, subjected to attacks by the imperialist states and um, uh, monopoly firms uh, uh, taking out the natural resources there and burning up the forest. No? Uh, but you see, uh, there is uh, um, uh, on the scale of the Philippines, Duterte is uh, responsible for the, the, uh, the continuing contribution of the Philippines to global warming and, you know, his aggravation, aggravation of the problems that make um, that super typhoons, um, uh, super typhoons, um, uh, uh, floods and droughts uh, uh, more destructive in the Philippines. Because uh, Duterte has continued the policy of uh, that he's attacking the indigenous peoples and uh, all those organizations helping uh, the, the indigenous peoples, including the religious, no, uh, so that he can uh, uh, he can uh, sell um, mm -hmm. uh, the land and the uh, natural resources uh, to uh, uh, logging plantation. And um, uh, 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 and other uh, corporations that ravage the forest, no. So and then um, um, there has been no attempt to restore the uh, the, the mangroves, you know. Uh, and so with the um, destruction of the forest uh, um, the that super typhoons that are speeded up eh, by the global warming of, of the Pacific Ocean come into the Philippines eh, um, without any kind of sangan without any kind of shield no so um, uh, you know the, the there has been um, boasting that uh, all the peasants uh, or anyone who will plant rubber uh, rubber plantations will make it rich, but the idiot doesn't um, uh, take into account the fact that the um, the foliage, the forest and the foliage in the Philippines have been so much abused and that there, are, there is no more shield of the Philippines against the, against the super typhoons. So uh, then you see the aggravation of the problem by Duterte himself uh, at the expense of the Filipino people. Nasa na tayo. Hello? Nawala kayo? Apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, I think my I, I got disconnected from the internet, but I'm back and I'm here. Sorry about that, Tito. Um, Tito, going sa uh, continuing yung Q&A natin sa ating um, sa ating uh, question and answer portion. Um, uh, it was asked here by an by an audience, what happens to the surplus product produced? by the foreign companies and how do these worsen the climate in vulnerable areas? Well, the surplus product can be understood as the product taken out by the uh, foreign monopolies from the Philippines and uh, practically the process of collecting the profits uh, uh, is completed abroad. And then they, and then they would, uh, um, these, these um, raw, the raw material especially, that comes from the uh, that come from the Philippines can be processed uh, and uh, and the manuf resulting uh, manufacturers would be dumped on the Philippines, preventing the development of the Philippines. And so uh, 
there is uh, multiple uh, uh, prejudice uh, against Philippine development uh, and because the Philippine economy is made dependent on the uh, foreign investments and loans and uh, the Philippines is the, always a target of uh, uh, dumping of manufacturers by the imperialist countries. Apologies about that. I'm losing my internet connection currently. Uh, however, yeah, I'm, yeah, hold on. Yeah. Sorry about that, Tito. Um, going back no, sa ating discussion, sorry. Um, it was asked here, um, sabi dito, is it true unsold products are being thrown in the ocean? Uh, it is highly probable that unsold products are destroyed. That's an old trick of um, um, the monopoly firms. They cannot sell their products, so uh, they create artificial uh, scarcity to be able to raise the prices and uh, uh, stimulate demand for uh, for the products. That's an old trick of the imperialists. And you know very well that um, um, the pandemic is supposed to have... Uh, uh, caused the breakdown and the reduction of uh, production, the slowdown of production. Uh, but you see, um, the people cannot afford to buy the products of industry because um, uh, the people lost jobs and other means of uh, livelihood. So the capacity to absorb the products of the monopoly firms has gone down. And uh, I would not be surprised if the monopoly firms would destroy their surplus products if they cannot sell them because that's the way um, uh, it's an it's an old method for raising profits and artificially creating demand uh, for uh, for the products i see tito um we had questions from people's church response um ang sabi po nila no so upcoming elections, dapat po ba may malinaw na plano o program ang mga presidential candidates tungkol sa climate crisis? Or in translation, in this upcoming election, uh, should the candidates or should the pres presidential candidates should have a clear plan or program to tackle climate crisis? The presidential candidates, if they are serious, should have uh, should address um, all major problems of the Filipino people. So uh, certainly the climate crisis is one of the problems, one of the major problems of the Filipino people. And of course, uh, there are the problems, uh, there are many more problems that arise uh, from the semi-colonial and semi-feudal character of the economy and the constant subjective subjection of the uh, people to um, to the escalating conditions of oppression and exploitation done by the imperialist powers and by their puppets uh, in the Philippines. So there, there are so many uh, big social problems and um, also the, um, the problem of climate crisis must be confronted because it involves the very existence of uh, humanity. It could mean uh, not, uh, by not facing up to this problem could lead to the extinction uh, of humanity. Yes, correct, Tito. Yeah, so it's really, it really should be within the platforms and uh, something that uh, uh, urgently needs tackling by the current government. Uh, Tito, going next, no, sabi dito, um, hold on, tagalin lang natin yung, yeah, sabi, um, how do the government of neocolonial state tackles climate crisis, especially in countries such as Philippines, Africa, South America, who are in the forefront of the struggle and also the effects of climate crisis you know if countries like the philippines can make a wise use uh, of um, of their natural resources and they develop 
uh, the Philippine econ uh, the Philippine economy. Uh, the Philippines should be less uh, uh, open, less vulnerable to abuse by the imperialist countries and by their foreign monopoly firms. So, uh, and yet there are technocrats, economists and technocrats who say, oh, uh, developing um, the Philippines, industrializing of the Philippines has become um, uh, um, uh, unsustainable um, because of considerations of uh, uh, keeping clean the environment and uh, 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 so but their, their logic is different. They, they would like to go keep on um, following the dictates of the imperialist countries and the foreign monopoly firms. And they don't see the logic that if the Philippines were to develop itself, uh, you make you wise utilization of its own resources, it will not uh, be given away. It will not be subject to um, as, as much plunder and um, ravaging of the environment uh, that the uh, foreign uh, monopolists have been uh, uh, inflicting, have been doing in the Philippines. And you, you see, um, right now, you know, during this Duterte regime, and uh, the Philippines, uh, all over the Philippines, you have, if you take the plane, you can see the open pit mining, and the whole country is marked by open pits, right. and um, and uh, you know the the biggest uh, thievery, uh, one of the big uh, kinds of uh, theft in the Philippines is uh, uh, taking away the mineral ores of the Philippines by Chinese companies uh, without uh, any documentation. So uh, taxes are not properly paid, uh, and uh, and so you know. When the time comes from the uh, when the time comes for the Philippines uh, to have its own political power and exercise it to develop the country, <laughs> and some so much of the natural resources have been already taken away because of the stupidity and thievery, corruption eh, of uh, uh, presidents like Duterte and his uh, uh, many successors. That's the problem. No, uh, a country like the Philippines is more vulnerable uh, to plunder of its natural resources if it does not have its own will to develop um, uh, its own economy and um, mm -hmm. makes a wise utilization of its own natural resources. Uh, if foreigners, if uh, the imperialists and monopoly firms are the ones that have the license to take out the natural resources, Naturally, they will not uh, think of the, um, the the rights and interests of the Filipino people. Right, I agree with you, Tito. Um, sabi dito naman on our next question po. Um, why do they say that the most vulnerable are the women and children? How different is the effect on them? Of course, the women and children. Uh, especially of the toiling masses of workers and peasants are the most vulnerable because you know the more you are poor uh, the more uh, you know you suffer from the class oppression and exploitation as well as from the national oppression and um, uh, and exploitation uh, imposed by the imperialist powers um, you, you see that traditionally there are so many factors uh, against uh, women and children, uh, and um, so uh, indeed uh, uh, the discrimination against them uh, becomes uh, becomes more grave, becomes aggravated when uh, the uh, social and environmental uh, conditions uh, uh, are are so bad and they generate uh, uh, more difficult conditions for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next up, Tito, sabi dito from our audience, uh, does individual efforts can contribute change to climate crisis, such as switching to metal straws, reusable bags, and boycotting plastics, etc.? <laughs> individual efforts contribute 
uh, chains like uh, switching to metal straws that could be more expensive no? <laughs> and reusable bags well uh, then there are plenty of um, uh, materials uh, for reusable bags uh, and probably let's know that should not be a license for using too much too much plastic bags too many plastic bags no? uh, mm -hmm. it would be better to have you know um environment friendly bags um, and of course the uh, it's noted uh, uh, plastic should be boycotted no it is well recognized that plastics uh, pollute uh, they are non degrade uh, non degrade biodegradable no? and they um, um, they're an attack on the environment and uh, uh, yes you can have collective effort successful if the individual efforts are also there, no, uh, because uh, the collectivity can become effective only if the big masses of individuals will follow and uh, they will will uh, will carry forward the just cause of environmentalism. Yeah, I agree they with will, you. They become capable of making demands on the government that does not listen, because bureaucrat capitalist, you know. Uh, would submit uh, uh, themselves to anything that uh, will uh, result in big bribes uh, for them from certain corporations uh, and other foreign interests. Yes, I agree with you, Tito. No? I think individual effort can only make change if we do it collectively. If we are collectively um, making efforts no, to, to do it and also collectively fighting against uh, the root causes of climate change, especially if we're, you know, all together marching, fighting, uh, bringing down uh, uh, the imperialism who's like number one source of climate crisis or, or the number one perpetrator of the climate change and uh, and different climate actions. And we should support it. I, I suggest to my fellow youths to join us in the upcoming uh, COP26 Climate Day of Action on November 6 in Glasgow. We, Anakbayan, United Kingdom, and Anakbayan, Europe will be present in that together with other environmental organizations such as Youth Advocates for Climate Action in the Philippines, um, Kalikasan, even International, and uh, all uh, other Filipino progressive organizations will be there. So, Tito, we are down to our last two questions from our audience. Uh, first, I would like to thank all the the audience who've um, sent their questions. Uh, who's who's those currently watching? Uh, can we greet uh, Ka Leo Cadio Pelletina, Miss Bebot Sean, uh, People's Church Response, and uh, Zeus Pilaes? Thank you for uh, trolling us and being in uh, joining us in the discussion. Uh, I hope you have learned a lot. Anyway. Uh, Tito, going back to our discussion, no, sabi dito sa ating uh, second to the last question, is the rapid development of urban cities bad for the global climate? Example, what they are doing in Dubai, converting the desert to metropolitan city or creating a man-made island? Uh, you know, uh, any plan of development should be um, well-proportioned, not lopsided, and um, it must be well paced. Uh, the content, the um, development plan uh, should mean for the Philippines uh, uh, a balance of industries and rural development. No? Mm -hmm. uh, but you see, uh, in um, and then the neoliberal policy, uh, it's not only a case of you know putting down the incomes of of, um, of uh, the working people. Uh, in order to increase the capital, uh, increase and hasten the capital accumulation of the the monopoly firms and the billionaires, no, um, mm. you see, it also in, involves uh, loose lending uh, for anti-development purposes. Um, well, for a country like Dubai, um, they can afford because they earn a lot of money from. Um, 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 from the special uh, case of being able to sell oil, no? But you see, under the neoliberal policy, even poor countries are in are uh, hooked uh, into mm -hmm. uh, borrowing money, eh? 
For in the case of the Philippines, um, the Philippines is um, it has been hooked into uh, uh, borrowing money to be able to put up all those uh, skyscraper uh, uh, skyscrapers in the Philippines, and uh, you know, um, uh, private construction is is favored. Uh, uh, at the expense of so you have a lot of billionaires in the Philippines uh, who actually abuse the foreign exchange income of these Filipinos of the 12 10 to 12 million Filipinos who separate themselves from their families and from their motherland no uh, and the the income of these overseas Filipinos have been used as a as a guarantee for fluidity of funds, but you know there is a limit uh, to uh, to borrowing, and so the Philippines now has a high, has, has a heavy debt burden, like uh, so many other countries. The public debt bubble is uh, now in the process of bursting, and this uh, uh, the borrowing has been done to finance uh, projects that uh, have not resulted in the development of the Philippines. So uh, remember the two aspects of a neoliberal policy, putting down, putting down the incomes of the working people in order to, uh, to accelerate the capital accumulation of a few people. No? And then uh, borrowing uh, is uh, promoted uh, in order to um, uh, deploy the, uh, the borrowed funds uh, for uh, projects especially in private construction, which do not result in the, the development of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with Tito. We're down to our last question, Tito. Sabi dito, is taxing, taxing the polluters and rich countries a solution to this, uh, to this crisis, I think? Indeed, the polluters uh, and all kinds of uh, um, unjust profit takers should be, uh, should be tasked. Uh, to should be properly tasked, no, and uh, um, you can you can uh, you can um, you can curse the billionaires for for saying that um, uh, uh, they earn a lot, they earn billions, but they are supposed to be generous. They have their philanthropic foundations. Why don't they? Why why uh, they should be made to pay the proper taxes? And uh, uh, they should not be presenting themselves this uh, monster, uh, this this um, uh, these monsters, which are who are very greedy, uh, should not be given an opportunity of present, presenting themselves as generous, and yet they avoid uh, uh, payment of taxes. And um, um, so that's the, that's the case, you know. And the neoliberal policy allows the thieves, the big thieves, and uh, the, uh, uh, pro the profit gougers eh, to uh, present themselves as Santa Clauses, but are, they're actually no less than uh, there, but they're actually uh, monstrous thieves eh, who must be mm. properly taxed. All right. Ayan, Dito. Thank you so much. That is the end of our question and answer floor. Uh, I hope uh, we've answered all the questions from our audience. If you didn't send, uh, if you haven't sent your questions today, you could always do that. We will have plenty more of discussion coming this week, upcoming episodes uh, in uh, the next following weeks, such as, you know, uh, I'll flash it over the screen. Hold on. Diba? Uh, on 24th of October, we will be tackling climate migration. So mga migrante uh, na nanonood dito sa ating uh, End the Line Online, we could uh, meet each other next week and uh, ask questions to Tito Jo and learn about the climate migration. And then the 31st of October, we will have system change, not climate change, uh, further deeping down topic on what solution can we offer in uh, the climate crisis, I know. So stand by and uh, share this date and save your calendars to join us next uh, in this upcoming episodes. Uh, another thing is we would be, I know, JMS uh, Tito Joss books 
are available now on all major platforms. You can visit Apple Books, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, Scribd, Amazon Books to actually read the writings. Uh, we have their critique of Philippine economy and phil- politics on philosophy of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, on cultural and art and literature, uh, upsurge of people's resistance, and the very famous Philippine society and revolution. So avail that and buy your books now. And again, mga kasamas, read and study the society. So ayon, Tito, um, again, thank you very, very much sa on answering po and being our guest in our in, in this episode of ND Line and our, our very special episode about climate crisis. Also, thank you for having me and uh, sharing my views uh, with you and uh, having an exchange through the questions that have been um, uh, asked uh, uh, from me to uh, ask of me to answer. Yes. Thank you so much, Tito. I've been uh, I, I've been away from ND Line uh, since last week from Ecos Amazon. It's really good to be back here and uh, enjoying this discussion with you po, and with the audiences. So uh, again, to our audiences, thank you. Thank you so much in participating. Uh, this video will be posted in uh, in our Facebook page on Akbayan Europa for everyone who missed something to follow up. And also it will be posted to Tito Jo, Jose Maria Sison's YouTube channel so you could watch it if you don't have Facebook or you know so if you're watching this in replay and um, thank you thank you so much for um, reviewing it with us and I hope you could send suggestion to us on which topics you want to be heard you want to hear you want to study more and give context to and uh, yeah to our fellow Filipinos in the country um, the election season is still going on. Uh, the, the registration to vote is still going on up until the 31st of October. So please go out and register to vote. If you are in overseas, unfortunately, um, uh, we, we haven't had enough time to uh, get the registration extended. So um, it, it has ended last week. So unfortunately, that is the condition for us. But if you have registered, please review uh, you review the track records of the candidates and um, vote all vote for the progressive and vote for the progressive changes we want to make in the country. Um, meanwhile, this is the National Democratic Line Online School, The Climate Imperialism. It has been uh, an enjoyed discussion. I am Christ with uh, Professor Joma Sison. Tito Jo, uh, again, mapagpalayang hapon po para sa ating lahat.
Yes.